share my screen, which should be being shared. Um, you all see the screen quite happily? Okay, good. Right, so today it's calcium and it's going to be quite in-depth calcium, really. Um, but I guess it's that sort of thing. If we want to go through it, let's go through it in detail. Um, so for calcium point of view, the, the, the main thing that we're looking at here is production of eggs. Uh, skeletal development in your chicks is also relevant as well, actually. But, but eggs obviously maybe is our overriding thing with the birds. Um, and I guess what we need to do is to... Um, understand a bit about why and how calcium works because if we want to try and get the the nutrition of our birds or avoid calcium related you know disease problems then we've got to work out got to understand how it works so you're gonna have a little bit of physiology first just to destroy your head um vitamin d is a an essential part of this um and in fact um birds get their their calcium from their diet, which is great, but without vitamin D, they're unable to absorb it sensibly. So you've got to have both in balance to get your calcium metabolism sorted. Um, and realistically, there's actually two ways that, that the birds would get uh, their vitamin D that either be directly from their diet or from ultraviolet B lighting. Um, so let's have a little move on to that for you. So this is going to make your head hurt a little bit but um, the fact of the matter is, is what we've got here is we have got vitamin d precursors if you like um, being absorbed from the intestine once that's been done that actually can under the action of uv light and heat make vitamin d um, which we'll come on to that in a little bit the other option is is you absorb vitamin d from your diet from your intestine and then basically that vitamin d goes to your liver where it's metabolized to your kidney where it's metabolized again and it's the 125 hydroxy vitamin d that actually is the active vitamin d that actually physically works the the other side to the coin here actually just worth mentioning is if you make vitamin d in your skin um, due to ultraviolet light you cannot overdose with vitamin D. If you get too much sunlight, it breaks down the vitamin D. So vitamin D toxicity, which we're coming on to now, I guess, is impossible with exposure to ultraviolet light. But if I give or I feed too much vitamin D, I can cause toxicity by overfeeding it. So one way is safe, the other way is potentially problematic. And I guess if we, we look at what a budgie is this is what a budgie is um and it's trying to find a, a point of reference for this and there isn't really any hard evidence yet for vitamin d metabolism in the budgies but we're talking about a species that comes from somewhere that is very hot and incredibly sunny um that realistically means their capacity for making vitamin d from sunlight should be quite significant part of their natural biology um and we know for example other species for example that are rainforest species for example whereby ultraviolet light impacting on vitamin d may be less of a factor for example so it is obviously a, a species specific thing um but i would anticipate that uv would be of critical importance to a budgie given its natural habitat the interesting thing though that aside is we have a pring gland um now the apring gland in your birds um basically this sits at the base of the tail this produces uh, an oily secretion from this gland and the birds basically smear this over their featherless skin when they're preening and in fact these oils that are produced by the preen gland this is what contains the vitamin d precursors so when a bird is exposed to sunlight those vitamin d precursors from the preen gland and made into vitamin D. And then when the bird is grooming itself, it ingests that oil to ingest its own vitamin D that's made as it were orally. In other words, the oral route works beautifully because that's what would happen naturally. It's just a question of whether they are making it 
from their skin oils or whether we're providing it in the diet. And this is a preen gland. My circle's a bit off, but you know, we all know the birds have the preen glands and that's where it sits. So I suppose, you know, we, we, our, our main concern about calcium, as we said, really it is, okay, they need it for maintenance of their body skeleton and, and normal physiology, but they also need it for a production when we're looking at our females here. And obviously the juveniles are reliant on their growth um, from parental nutrition. Um, and this food mostly will be coming from the hen at that point. I'm going to deviate and we said it's about budgies but I'm now going to talk about African greys instead um, because this is one that has had uh, one of the species of, of citizen that has had a probably the most extensive look at calcium metabolism so we're looking at an African species here so you have to now start thinking about whether an African species of citizen is equating to an Austra Australasian species but um, African greys are one where we see a lot of metabolic bone disease um, very, very common in juveniles, and we see this as a lack of calcium, lack of vitamin D, and a lack of UV light, and selective feeding as well. And I thought if I go through the, I guess, the clinical presentation we see in the greys, you'll see lots of things here that will directly apply to how you care for your budgies. And of course, you get a lot of these, and, and you know, this is where the hen sat too tight on the chicks and you're seeing a, a young grey parrot coming in here with multiple legs going in different directions, splay leg if you want to call it that, um, this sort of type thing. Uh, and this sort of age group and of course a lot of the breeders then will start trying to do silly things like stick the legs together with a pair of bands because that's going to solve their problem. Um, and of course, the problem here isn't splay leg. It's not that the hen's sitting too tight on the chicks. This is bone deviation due to lack of calcium in these juveniles. And these, when they get to this sort of stage here, this, the, these need surgical correction. Uh, in this case, you need surgical correction of both limbs, um, where you have to refracture the bone, straighten them all up, refixate them together again. And you're hoping that the tendons will realign and keep the legs in a straight line so that you have a functional bird. Um, and when you're looking at these from a clinical perspective, you're talking a bird here that's five, six hundred quid's worth. And even then, your parrot breeders are so stupid they can't get the diet right. And this is another case here. Photo's a bit fuzzy, but the fact of the matter is this one's going for surgery now, but you can see we've got multiple fractures here, limb distortions. This bird is just a complete disaster. And much as we're seeing it on the legs, we've got it on the wings, we've got it on the keel, we've got it on the spine, we've got it on the pelvis. Um, you know, everything on this bird has been just hideously distorted through just inadequate nutrition uh, on, the, on the bird from the word go. This is just an x-ray here. And again, you can just hopefully see the differences in size and shapes of uh, the bones here, that this is just absolutely horrendous. Um, and it's something that shouldn't be present in, in the pet trade for the grey parrots. Um, but equally, it is obviously, you know, an extreme case, whereas we won't be seeing such a level of severity in the budgies. But, you know, this is the point of reference that we're using. And this is another one here, an older bird now, this is an adult bird that had been sold, coming in as an adult, chewing its legs and feet, because basically it's been, it's been walking around like Charlie Chapman all its life and has a major joint pathology now because of just chronic distortion and pain, all emanating from being uh, a calcium deficient as a juvenile. And again, Another picture, more x-rays here. The fact of the matter is, is this is incredibly common uh, and very frustrating from a clinical point of view because it's easily solvable. So when you're looking across at the budgies, the question is, is well, do we see something similar in the birds? Um, you know, when we're getting these coming through, and absolutely we do. I think it's less common. Um, I think some of these, I have a little bit of a worry that there may be some polyoma virus involved uh encouraging poor nutrition in the chicks at this point but we certainly do see it 
if we look at the pet parrot trade, then there's three options that they will be undertaking to rear their babies. Um, I guess the the first option would be where the the parents are rearing their own chicks. Now, this is a scenario with the budgies, I guess, in most cases. Um, in these circumstances, the um, chicks that are generated are wild, so they're not really much use. They're less tame, less money, so why would you let the parents rear them? Okay, if you're breeding birds for, for, for you know, getting pairs for breeding, that's a different scenario. The next option the pet parrot trade might do would they incubate the eggs. And what they do this for is that they want the hen to double clutch. So if, you, if the hen lays a bunch of eggs, you whip the eggs away and incubate them, the hen will go on and lay another clutch of eggs, which means I get twice as many eggs, potentially twice as many chicks, and if I'm selling them at 500 pounds a time, well, then that's more money for me. This does mean your chicks are tame because you're hand rearing them, but in the first seven days, those of you that hand rear and top up budgies, you'll know that's quite a, a challenge to do that. Um, and the middle ground a lot of people would go for, for these would be they would let the hen incubate the eggs, hatch the chicks, rear them for the first week, and then you pull the chicks at that point, then hand rear them just as their eyes are about to open. You still get the tame chicks, you still get a double clutch, you just get to sleep for that week. And I suppose the reason I'm mentioning this to you is really it boils down to nutrition of that chick. If I'm incubating the eggs and I'm gonna hand rear that chick, then we have commercial diets that are nutritionally sound and balanced that work really well for rearing citizens. They don't need supplementation, they don't need messing about with, you know, even if people who think they know things have been suggesting you add stuff to hand rearing foods, whose brand will remain unknown, they're talking rubbish. Um, you have very, very good foods specifically designed for hand rearing, which work well. So in this sort of scenario, great, I can rear these chicks and I very rarely will have metabolic bone disease problems because the diet I'm using is perfectly balanced. The slight problem we do have with these is they are, of course, nutritionally def deficient the moment they hatch. These chicks are dependent, absolutely dependent, on egg quality. That's down to shell quality, the calcium content of shell, and nutritional content of both the, of the yolk and the albumin. So if your hen is feeding a deficient diet while she's producing eggs, that egg will be deficient and you will have a deficient chick that hatches. Now, okay, if I hand rear from day one because I've incubated it, then I will probably compensate for that because before you get the rapid growth phase um, in this chick, it's getting a sensible diet. So I'll probably avoid growth abnormalities. Trouble you've got is if you leave them for a week, um, which is a normal sort of scenario, they undergo that rapid growth phase at that stage. And the first bit of a, a citizen that grows rapidly are its legs. That's what it does, because it stands up on its legs, it shouts louder, it gets fed more, it's a whole nester. The legs are the first bit that grow, followed by the wings. So if you're going to see growth deformities coming out as a major issue during this rapid growth phase, you're gonna see the legs affected to the worst scenario because they're the first long bones to really get growing. And this is just another, this is another a gray rearing facility here, but they're incubating separate airspace and things um, to keep them disease free, which we'll come back to when we talk about PBFD or polyoma in, in another evening. Um, but obviously this is quite a big trade that they do. Um, and obviously, you know, for, for the gray parrots, getting parental nutrition right so you get good quality eggs is critically important followed by if the birds are going to be doing some rearing themselves for the first seven days you've got to get the nutrition right and when i say get the nutrition right this is not what you're offering this is the food the hen is taking that hen is choosing what food she wishes to regurgitate to these chicks and if you feed the best diet on the planet and the hen's not eating it, chicks aren't getting it. They're still going to be nutrient deficient because the bird isn't eating it. So there is an element here 
that if you want to get good nutrition in the chicks and they're being parent reared, you have to get the parents to be feeding on the diet that you want them to be taking ready in preparation for the, the babies to get the nutrition you want. So the chicks that we're seeing in these groups, the ones that are more prone to metabolic bone disease are absolutely going to be the parent reared because the mother is selecting, I'm just gonna feed them millet today, which is we, we know is calcium deficient. The ones born at seven day old are still at risk because they've undergone the rapid growth phase initially. The incubated eggs, probably you won't see clinical signs because you're going straight on to a decent hand rearing food at that point. And I put Nutribut up here, but you know the fact of the matter is, is this is quite a big market. Um, the diet will compensate, and all of the major brands of the hand rearing food have been used for decades at rearing citizens. Citizens that are worth thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, full detailed nutrient analysis on these products. They absolutely are rock solid, um, with no need for modification. And I'm going to chuck a few papers in here as well, because it's obviously some evidence based here, but there's loads of um, papers on here from, from the poultry side, which we can sort of steal, because in the end of the day, from a poultry point of view, hatchability and, and growth rate of your chicks or quality of eggs that are laid are critically important to a successful business in the poultry industry. So there's loads of work out there. Okay. I've already asked the question of, can we say a budgie is an African grey? We certainly can not say it's a chicken, but you've got to start somewhere. And the data is there from, from lots of work done from the poultry industry. So like I say, we said, basically it's pulled at seven days old or, or, or the um, chicks that are parent reared are, are the ones that are gonna be an issue. And to be honest, this is a scenario with our budgies. We're, we're not hand rearing our birds, they're being parent reared. So the problem we get with the greys in this scenario, we're getting all of our baby budgies. And I've just put this diet up here as a standard African grey diet here, but you can just see the scenario. If the hen is just feeding off what is the deepest, most unpleasant seed mixture on the plan, planet, if she just fills the chicks full of that, they've had a deficient egg and now she's just shoving sunflower down their throats and that's equally as deficient. So that's not helping. The good thing though with the hand rearing diets is we know they're designed to be a total diet for juvenile citizens whilst they're being reared. They're balanced, they work. So if we're looking at what sort of diet perhaps we might be looking to be feeding our birds whilst they're rearing chicks, then you could argue there is a logic here in, in trying to emulate this hand rearing food during the breeding season for your breeding pairs. And in terms of today's discussion where we're looking at calcium content or vitamin D content of food, then clearly we've got a couple of guidelines here in terms of, okay, this is the level I should be looking at for the um, diet that I would want to be my parent birds, as it were, to be feeding my chicks. They work. They work beautifully. They do what they say on the tin. Absolutely used decades and decades and decades uh, of successful citizen rearing. Then if we jump now and say, okay, well, what about egg foods? What, what, what about egg foods that we're looking at rearing birds with, you know, CD, EMP, Sluis, Whitmolan, Versalaga, you know, the, you, there's loads of them, isn't there, obviously. And they're all basically this egg and biscuit mixture, which, we, which is, is here. And when we look at their composition in terms of calcium and vitamin D content, you'll see they're actually not that far off the hand rearing foods. Um, the slight problem you've got here, though, is the hand rearing foods are designed to be the sole food source for rearing that chick. An egg food we would classically use that as a supplement to the normal diet. So much as this egg food is probably balanced in its own right, if it was the only food your adult birds were feeding to the chicks, great. But we know that they don't do that. We know that they shove loads of millet sprays and other bits and pieces in them as well. So, or groats or something else that you're feeding. So we know 
that much as I might be feeding an egg food and that is balanced, if that's a small percentage of the diet, the diet is no longer balanced, it's still deficient. And much as I blanked out the, the brand of this, if you're going to go and start adding things into your diet, I need to know what's in it. If I am trying to emulate my hand rearing food, I'm trying to emulate egg food, then if I don't know the calcium content or vitamin D content of my supplement or my food that I'm giving, I, I haven't even got out the starting gate in terms of working it out. So get a product that actually has some decent nutrient analysis on it so we can actually work out how much of this, where and how we're going to do that. The thing to be aware of if you're looking at doing nutrient analysis of anything, costs about three grand for detailed nutrient analysis. So a lot of the small businesses out there dealing with um, budgies or, or, or pigeons, what have you, they might not have the funds to do that because they're a small business. But a large company that's been selling lots of product, this would be nothing to them. This would be something they routinely do to get their food analyzed. So as far as I'm concerned, get something with a nutrient analysis that's proven over the years stop messing about with something that realistically we have no idea what it is and the thing that you've got here as well is just because your birds eat the food and appear to like it doesn't mean it's any good at all for them it just means they like to eat it so nutri bird again just for one of the examples here but there's a nutrient analysis on the label for detail you you can knock yourself out so how do we solve these problems? Well, this is actually, uh, Stan is, is my uh, previous boss, I actually worked with Stan for seven years whilst he was doing um, his fellowship for the Royal College. Uh, and his fellowship basically, were, were in essence, was a 30,000 word uh, thesis solely based on calcium metabolism in the grey parrot. So a lot of this, this work that's come out has come out of Stan's fellowship, which he did Ooh, about 15 years ago now so this isn't necessarily new stuff we're talking about tonight and a lot of papers came from that as well and he was looking at greys did some work on pionus as well um, but obviously there's a lot of data there which i was you know dealing with doing it uh, and just a case in point this is the the setup for the greys that were used in the study there was 40 breeding pairs um, where they were looking at comparing seed diets versus pelleted diets versus exposure to UV, not exposure to UV, and looking at their calcium metabolism to see what differences it made uh, to them. Uh, and basically, it was using UV lights, which we got on the left here, and pelleted feeds such as the, the Harrisons, which was actually what was used in, in, in these greys on the other side. Now, um, if we look at the nutritional analysis of those two feeds, so we're looking now at the seed diet. So these are on a standard parrot mixture. It actually was tidy mix that they were on, which those who keep parrots will know. But the point to make here is we go down and we look at our calcium percentage, and it's 0 0.08 in seed. We look at vitamin D, well, there, there's none. Um, and then you look at the pelleted diet, so this is designed to be a complete ration for adult citizens and again you're pitching in with calcium 0.9 vitamin d1650 you know these levels in the complete citizen pellets the levels in a hand rearing diet the levels in soft food or egg food pretty much all mirror each other these products are all very similar on the tried and tested products with proper nutrient analysis they match but the point here is seed has no calcium seed has no vitamin d this is why all those babies have bendy legs in the gray parrots and this is what we're feeding to our budgies and the interesting thing here when we're looking at uh which stan used to to, to love doing to upset his sponsors but he used to, it used to amuse him but if we look at uh vitamin d content of the birds now so this is this is looking to say okay how much vitamin D does that bird have? We know it's integral, we know it's important. And if we look here at birds on the left circle here that are on a seed diet without access to UVB, they've got a value of 70. 
we know if we give those birds enforced exposure to UV light, okay, that could be sunlight. In this case, it was artificial lights from Arcadia. It bumps it up to 130. What we also know is if we um, take a bird that's fed on seed and we expose it to UV light, um, we get the same level that we would get if we were feeding it on pellets. So Stan's favorite quote was that Harrison's is as good as sunshine. Basically, if you take a seed fed bird and you stick it out in the sun, its vitamin D levels will match a bird that's inside that's fed on pellets. And if you take a pellet fed bird and stick it outside, there's no difference between the vitamin D in that than a bird just to give an access to UVB. But of course, our birds now don't get access to UVB. We have them inside. They don't live outside of the flights. Um, from a, a clinical point of view, this is one of our negative pressure bird units we use in the clinic. Uh, again, negative pressure to stop disease transmission between patients. So, so the air is drawn in from the, from the room, but we have UV on all of our birds coming in that are sick as standard. Again, just happens to be a great parrot sitting in there on, on this particular one. So if you're going to use UV light to solve your problem, it's got to be direct, it's got to be unfiltered. This means your outside aviary has to be open with no roof covering. And I don't think there's many people now that would have an outside aviary with no roof covering. There's probably not many people with birds that would actually want to go outside and do that and fly around. They're probably all sitting on the bottom of the aviary inside, not really moving much. And that's really a nature of, of perhaps the way the birds have changed in the last sort of couple of decades. So artificial sources are great. Um, They've got to be changed every breeding season because the amount of UV coming from an artificial source diminishes over time and they have to be close. You need to be within 12 inches of the birds. So this is just a, actually a reptile UV light here, but this is a UVB meter, which we use a lot for measuring UV output for uh, our reptile patients in zoos or, or coming into the clinic, uh, this sort of type of thing. But basically when you're right next to a UV producing tube, you've got 309 microwatts per centimeter squared. The moment you creep away, this value starts shrinking away, okay? So for UV, artificial UV lights to be of any benefit to your birds, they have to be close. Now, I don't know that a budgie is an African gray parrot. Um, hopefully in a few years, I will be able to answer that question, but at the minute, I don't know that they are an African gray parrot. Um, we don't know how much of an impact UVB lighting is going to have on them, but as I said, they are diurnal species that come from a sun country that has lots of sunlight naturally. They should be able to make use of UVB. Um, we also don't know if we put vitamin D in the water if that's going to help, because we, we don't know. They might drink it, they might not. Um, and it's also probably not going to work because of intermittent provision, and I'll come on to why um, that's a problem. And again, we don't know how effective, how effective in food additives are either because we don't know that they're eating it. And again, sunlight is probably what they're used to having. So if we look back at our husbandry, if you're thinking, okay, here's my birds. Uh, these are some pictures of my dad's old setup. Um, they're in wooden stock cages. How I can get UV light into these sensibly is quite problematic. Better, uh, but I need the roof to be uncovered for them to get access. Arcadia do do lamps designed actually for pet citizens inside. They have these little compact lamps, which are very nice actually. Um, in an aviary setup, I can put a light in the roof like this, but the question is, is how many of those birds are within 12 inches of that light? Maybe the ones on the top perch in one specific location, but the vast majority of them are not getting access to UV in the amounts needed from that UV tube. Um, again, another set of my, my birds from, from previous. Um, UV strip again in the light, in the aviary, but again, good for general illumination, good for bringing out their colours, good for getting them into breeding condition because of the UVA, but the UVB exposure might be a little bit more limited, might be quite more difficult to 
get it into these birds. Sam's picture again. Um, Sam's aviary is covered on the top. His UV is going to be limited coming through unless they hang on to the bars on the side. Other picture here, this is one inside again, my previous one of my dad's. There's windows, whoop de doo dar, windows filter out UV. You know that because if you're driving in the car, you don't get sunburn unless you stick the arm out of the window. And if you're sitting in the conservatory, you don't get sunburned. You want to get sunburned, you do a George, you take your top off and you go outside in the sun in your garden. Um, so, you know, there's, there's difficulty getting natural UV into these as well. This is the Arcadia setup with the, the, the clamp clamps on the side. Um, works fine for a bird in a small cage, for a pet parrot. You can forcibly expose them to it for four hours a day and that will sort out their vitamin D status. And the beauty of this, of course, is you don't have to worry about selective feeding. It doesn't matter what you eat, you're going to get the UV. Um, where we get stuck with a lot of big citizens and small citizens is if I want to change your diet, they don't take it because it's weird, it's strange, they don't like it. And I sort of equate the, the, that sort of scenario, which I use for the students as well, it's like trying to persuade my dad to eat Chinese food. Okay, if it wasn't gammon um, egg and chips, he wouldn't eat it. You give him Chinese food, firstly, it's weird, it looks weird, um, tastes different, feels different. And then if you gave him a pair of chopsticks and said, this is how you eat it, you don't have to eat it with a fork. Now you eat it with chopsticks, just in the same way that a bird doesn't have to dehusk soft food. It's dehusking seed, that's what it's learned to do. So not only is the food different, the way in which they eat it is different as well. And that can make it very confusing for a citizen that's been institutionalized, if you like, into eating in a certain way, in a certain setup. Um, that, that can be quite scary for them to change. Just in the same way, my birds have been given a toy today and they hate it. They're currently running away thinking, what is this stuff? It's gonna take them three or four days to realize it's not gonna kill them. Um, so they are naturally skeptical of something different and you have to try and overcome that. So this is my setup. Now, I've got strip lights in, uh, actually LED lights in the middle of the room, general illumination. But if I want to get UV into my birds, I've got to have UV strip lights as we've got on the right here, and that has to feed down every single cage all the way around, okay? So this is a setup now where between each block of wire cages, I have UV coming on on a timer, these birds cannot avoid that UV. They are getting UV guaranteed. That will normalize their calcium by the sheer nature of having exposure to that. Um, okay, it does mean I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I've got about 11 UV tubes running for the breeding pairs. Um, like I say, more difficult to get it into the avers, but we'll come back on to the differences between those when you get to it. There's loads of stuff on chickens as well. Um, and I, I guess on this abstract here, the first line, if you read it, says hen nutrition is critical for optimizing egg quality. And egg quality is what we need here. We're talking about chicks to some extent, um, but we've got to think about that hen's viability for laying a functional nest. Uh, we don't want her to get egg bound. We don't want her to have an oviduct prolapse. We don't want soft shelled eggs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera or poor quality eggs that they've got, poor quality egg shell. All of those are eggs that are just a waste of a hatch. They could have been fertile, could have had the best chick in the world in them. We don't know because you never get that far. We do have, of course, lots of work done on the minimum requirements for poultry for laying, rearing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think we, we, if we're going to stop and look at chickens for a little bit, we have to realise that the egg quality you want for commercial production is different to what we require for viable bre breeding of our citizens. Um, and in fact, chickens are, are fed excessive levels of vitamin D to try and ramp up the amount of vitamin D in the eggs for human consumption to try and avoid us getting hypervitaminosis D, which is quite entertaining. It's one of the, the routes that the UK use to try and improve our vitamin D status. In the US, they fortify milk with vitamin D, for example, to try and stop vitamin D deficiency in people. And going back to George again, 
George is going to be quite good indeed efficient, even though he does try uh, sitting out in his garden. Most people in Scotland are vitamin D deficient. But the interesting thing when we're looking at egg quality coming from the hen is eggshell quality is critical to embryo viability from a breeding point of view. And certainly from a, from a human egg consumption point of view, the egg colour and quality of shell is, is determines on whether it's one you're going to sell at a sensible price or it's a second quality egg that gets kicked out. Um, interestingly enough, when you're looking at laying hens, they have a requirement of 3.4% calcium in the diet to maintain adequate eggshell production during their laying nutrition. And um, that's quite a lot. That's actually 110 grams of calcium a day. It's a ridiculous amount. Um, now, basically, when you go down and start looking at what is an eggshell, most of your eggshell, 94% of your eggshell is calcium carbonate. That's where the calcium all ends up going in these hens, and that's the major compound. And we'll be familiar with deficient eggs. This is one of mine um, from my birds this year. You may ask, why is she calcium deficient? I'll tell you exactly why she's having issues with this, because she's an older hen. Um, older hens struggle getting their reproductive performance to the same degree as a young hen. And she's also a hen that was bred at my dad's. This means this hen was an adult when it came to me. And much as I have changed the feeding regime round to compensate for things, this hen is not so keen on taking the food on feeding because she was never reared on it. Or the young hens I've got are far more akin to the diet and therefore are taking a greater percentage in the diet, a more balanced diet, because they're taking it voluntarily. Whereas this hen is like, a, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to change what I was reared on. So eggshell quality is critically important, um, basically to get them hatching, to stop infection getting in there, keeping the right amount of moisture content in that egg. Um, we know older hens will struggle with that. The interesting thing for the chickens is um, they have a 10% turnover of their body calcium a day. So 10% of their skeleton, as it were, goes into that egg every day that they're laying. So they have medullary bone, which they use as, as a store for this. And a chicken that's laying eggs, basically it will use half of its blood calcium. So half of the calcium in its blood, which it needs to keep itself alive, gets sucked up every minute into the eggshell. So they need to have calcium available to replenish that on a continuous basis. They do compensate from their medullary bone stores, but if they're not getting calcium continuously, they will become deficient. So if you are giving calcium in your drinking water once a week to your hens and she's laying for the whole of that week, she's probably got some calcium from the water for the first egg. She probably hasn't got any for the next three that week. So in water calcium once a week, pointless. I don't think anybody's going to be doing in water calcium daily either because that's equally a risk in toxicity as we've mentioned but you are looking at these birds when they are laying when they're rearing you need a trickle feed of a continuous source of calcium to maintain that reproductive viability much as they've got medullary bone the chickens they use that medullary bone store in one day that goes on the first egg they replace it the following day. It's not there as a permanent store, it goes and is replenished. This is just medullary bone here in, an, in uh, I think it's a lovebird actually, um, but the bones basically become whiter and thicker relative to normal. Uh, this is one here now that's a peak of laying. Okay, she only has one egg and she's egg bound, but you can see here how the bone structure is really filled up with this bone resource, the calcium resource that they use. Our budgies do the same as this. And of course, if we've got eggs that are weak, no eggshells, hen becomes egg bound. Now you've lost your hen as well and the eggs don't good either. So getting your calcium metabolism right to maximize the viability of your egg maximizing the viability of the embryo and preventing reproductive disease in the hen is absolutely critical. 
collection of reproductive diseases here, all of which are pertaining to calcium. Lower right is a hen that had to be euthanized because she was trying to lay an egg but never managed to produce an eggshell. She was that deficient. So this is the albumin from within her oviduct coming out. Um, this basically, I guess, is, is this isn't a hen with egg peritonitis. This is a different condition although she would clinically present in layman's terms in a very similar scenario with a bloated out belly. You're feeling it and it feels soft and squidgy, but it doesn't feel like an egg because she hasn't even tried to form a shell. Top pictures here is a malformed egg with a very weak shell that was palpable, but this is an oviduct prolapse. She's tried to lay this egg and she's prolapsed her oviduct instead. Another hen that's gone, lost, lost to calcium. And bottom left here is an egg bound hen, again, calcium drop at the point of lay, lack of ability to uh, have smooth muscle contraction, and again, another hen that may be lost to breathing or lost permanently, depending on how good you are at getting your eggs out. All of this is preventable with appropriate calcium nutrition, I guess. Shell quality actually is critically important because this is the calcium that allows the chick to grow. And what it also does as the chick absorbs the calcium from this eggshell, this weakens that eggshell to enable the chick to hatch. So if your eggshell lacks calcium, it's too porous, the egg dries out, embryo dies. So getting the right amount of calcium in here to act as a source for that chick is particularly in need. And in chickens, which okay, they have a slightly longer incubation than our budgies, but these rapid changes in calcium is between day 14 and 18 of incubation. This is the period when that embryo is using the most calcium from that shell as a prelude to weakening it, followed by hatching. And there's lovely papers again, loads of papers on chickens looking at this um, because it's of economic importance. So that's it done. And you can see quite nicely here. Uh, looking at the calcium content of a shell, how day 18 is not, you know, day 14 is the same as day one, 18 drops back, day 21 at point of, point of hatch uh, is reduced down markedly. And again, this matches with this embryo sucking the calcium out of that shell uh, as it's maturing. So back onto budgies. We know for a budgie for maintenance, we need 0.85% calcium. We know if you give a budgie just seed, um, then they might cope with a round or two rounds a uh, push, but they will then just deplete everything and they're going to reproductive failure. Because budgies have um, attritional chicks, so these are chicks that need to be raised by the parent, their egg size is relatively smaller than birds that have precocial chicks, like a chicken. So the calcium requirement that a budgie has is therefore less during egg laying than a chicken. So chickens might be 3.3%, but we know for the budgies, you'll probably get away with 1%, 1.15%, something around that order for laying and rearing. So it's a little bit of a step up for maintenance, but not dramatic but you'll still see your maintenance budget requirement here is 0.85%. That's still 10 times the amount of calcium that's in seed. So, the interesting thing, and this goes back to, to, to Waltham, um, studies that were done, gosh, in the 1990s, 2000s, um, and they actually were, were the, the, the height of trill and the, you know, uh, being trying to quote, persuade everybody to take trill on board, did a few papers at the time, um, which largely I don't think actually were fed back to the fancy at all. Um, one of their papers, actually, the interesting point that I pulled out from it was where they were looking at birds fed seed and cuttlefish and grit, which were their sources of calcium. 24% of the eggs that were laid were broken. Um, now, okay, I'm making a leap of faith here, but these weren't hen stomping on them because they were crazy, um, but more like these are shells that were weak in the first place. Um, and that's a massive loss of reproductive viability for birds given seed with cuttlefish and grit. 
which in my mind says, well, then the cuttlefish fish and grit were not doing their job in terms of getting enough calcium into these birds. Okay, their vitamin D status is unknown. Um, and again, loads of things on the poultry, looking at amounts, looking at percentages that they need on there, and at what points they, they need that. Um, and again, the point here on the bottom part of here, which I put in here is, as hens age, the eggshell quality is reduced. Um, again, they struggle holding that together. But this actually was a, a pitch that Roy Applin shared, which I nicked. Um, but um, basically, you know, the BS was funding Waltham and to, to, to help with this and, and the information just never really got out to the fancy. I guess it was all the use drill, use drill, use drill without actually looking at what actually was being said in the, some of the research they were doing at that time. Um, but this is one of their papers that came out uh, looking at nutrition in birds generally in quite a lot of depth, which was great. Um, this was actually some of the nutrient analysis they'd done on, on seed at the time, and I've put red millet, white millet on here, canary seed and groats. And again, look at your calcium percentage. We've just said they need 0.85%, and even in groats, we're still half of what they need. Um, sorry, this is in grams per kilogram, so I beg your pardon. Um, you need to divide it by a factor of 10, sorry, so it's 0.04% here um you know awful or awful amounts and your phosphorus is shooting up through the roof as well so your calcium to phosphorus ratio here is quite appalling we really need a ratio of two to one as a minimum for most diets is recommended let alone trying to breed so seed is just or seed um, is awful in terms of calcium and phosphorus content so any of your birds that are living off on a seed diet will be calcium deficient full stop they probably have more than enough phosphorus knocking around there is no point giving supplemental phosphorus to these birds whatsoever um, and again there's lots of commercial products out there that contain dicalcium phosphorus for example and that's just completely crazy and a pointless thing to have in a supplement um, because they've got enough phosphorus it's the calcium that's the problem and dicalcium phosphorus as is said it's a two to one ratio We've got a lot of compensation to do here for, for a deficiency diet. As I've said before, if you're going to do something stupid, at least be aware you are. And feeding seed to budgies is stupid. So if you're going to try and compensate for that, you've got to um, have in your mind what level of calcium I'm going to have to try and correct this deficiency. And we're basically going to make the assumption that seed has none. So your soft food or your in-water supplementation that you're giving to your birds, that is their sole calcium and vitamin D source. Your seed is providing none of that. So how are we going to get, how are we going to solve this problem? Option one, we can add it in the water. But how often do you want to do that? Do you want to do it daily? Because as we said, the hens that are laying eggs, they need it daily. They're going to absorb it all and use it and producing that eggshell and it's going to be gone by tomorrow. Uh, are we going to try and do an intermittent supply? Is that going to work when they're laying eggs continuously? Is this, is this doomed to failure? If I put it in food, okay, then you can drink what you like. I'm not going to influence your water intake. But my birds need to eat it, as we said with the grey parrots. If you're used to eating sunflower seed, you can be given the best soft food in the world. But if you're just going to eat your sunflower seed, it's no point. And most birds will select foods, what they were offered as juveniles, what their parents taught them to eat. And a bird's ability to select a balanced diet doesn't happen. My ability to select a balanced diet doesn't happen. OK, there's lots of plasticity in what diet species will tolerate. But my diet is appalling. I'm choosing things that I like to eat. But that's not the best thing. And there's loads of little papers out there looking at nutrition of citizens and going, okay, well, can I make a homemade diet that works by mixing seed and, and fresh produce and pellets? Can I make a balanced diet for my citizens? Um, and basically the answer is no, you can't do that. 
Um, going through the abstract here, you know, they're offered produce at 50%, 25% pellets, 25% seed. They're still deficient in calcium, sodium, iron, and loads of excessive fat. And the other point here is, in addition, the birds chose foods that exacerbated those imbalances. They made it worse by dietary preferences. And until you started knocking the seed back to 18% and pushing up the pellets in this diet, they didn't actually get towards having a balanced diet at all. So um, you've got to have very small amounts of seeds going through to get a nutritionally balanced diet. And to be honest, nobody is with the budgies. We have to be well aware of that. Um, so if we're not going to utilise pellets, we've got to then think very hard about what am I going to do to improve what is the world's worst diet on the planet. Another interesting thing here, this is a budgie paper now looking at the immune status of, of budgies on different diets as well. And we're all aware of how important it is to eat the right diet to stimulate your immune system. And, and there's lots of supplements out there that are marketed on that basis. Uh, this is going to make your birds big and strong and healthy and they'll be resistant to all sorts of diseases. This is just a lovely paper. OK, possibly a flawed paper, but it's showing budgies on a lovely pelleted diet versus those on a seed based diet um, versus those on KT and looking at the immune response and system of, of these birds on a beautifully balanced diet versus one that's completely rubbish and the impact on their immune system was zero. So seed is rubbish or seed is rubbish worrying about how much of this or that or where it came from it's completely irrelevant it's all seed and it's all rubbish we just need to be done with that and accept that fact we're not going to be feed feeding pellets you can't it's cost, cost prohibitive for large numbers everybody else is feeding seed we need to convert all the outcrosses back to pellets they'd starve um or stave if you misspelled starve um you know like like again going back to my dad if i gave him a chinese with chopsticks he would starve to death it, it, it's not gammon steak not gammon egg and fries so um and if you're selling birds everybody else is feeding seeds so they're going back onto seed this really isn't going to work for for the fancy in terms of going onto pellets um i think we have to accept that we're going to be feeding seed of some description So if you're going to try and improve the diet of your birds from a calcium point of view, which I guess is today's topic, there's a couple of things you need to do. You've got to breed your own hens first up because these hens that are being weaned or fledging straight onto the diet you want them to eat, they will be more receptive to taking it. They will take it and they will then feed it to the chicks. If you're buying in an outcross hen, that's had a completely different feeding regime. You give it something different that you're giving to yours, and it's like, I don't know what that is. I know what millet spray is. I know what panic and millet, you know, I know what white millet is. I'm going to eat that. Um, but it's probably going to reject your soft food. And of course, if you do put a novel food in there, as is the case, we all, everybody loves messing around with their diets. You, you know, all the birds don't take it. They've never seen it before. Of course, they're not going to take it. You have to train them to do so, and they have to do so when they fledge the nest. That's when you're going to get them to take the new food. So once you're getting your babies taking your soft food as they fledge, they will then accept that food source much more readily at that time point. You're going to keep it going out of the breeding season because as we said all birds will be calcium deficient so they're all going to need soft food every day um okay different amounts of volumes maybe in, in terms of what the consistency is but you're gonna get them used to taking your soft food that's consistent because you want them to eat it when they're due to lay their eggs and you want them to feed it to the babies to allow good growth in the babies I'll stop sharing just for one second because I have no idea what the time is. Do you want to do a tea break, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's half eight. So um, we've been going an hour. 
So yeah, should we have a tea break? That's not, that's not bad because I had no idea what the time was. Whoa. Can I just say, that's not bad. That's pretty good. No, that's very, very good, yeah. Kevin, where are you? I can't chat here forever. I'm right here. Oh. Well, what are we waiting just, for then? If everybody else is, is if everybody else is good to go, I'm I'm good to go. I was well, just, I just actually can I can see a, I can see quite a few empty seats. Uh, have you cleared the room, George, in our absence because your witty banter was insufficient? <laughs> okay. So the whole point for, for getting your, your hens to take the food that you want them to take is they feed that to the chicks. The babies get trained to take it as chicks. Okay, your outcross cocks might be less keen, but you know what? They're not going to be such a factor when the babies are growing in the nest. They're not laying the eggs either. Um, and the babies normally that fledge would then just go straight to it because it's there and they're receptive at that time point. And of course, you know, if they've been, hand, if they've been fed it from, from the hen in their box, then this is familiar tasting as well. Um, now, interestingly enough, my soft foods changed to, to be green this year, um, which actually is quite handy because if, if, if I'm seeing chicks with a bunch of green crops, then I know they're getting the soft food as it were. So not saying you have food dye to it, but it is quite an interesting finding. So let's think about things now, trying to bring this together in terms of what, what can we do, given we know we're doing something that is completely stupid, uh, such as feeding seed. We're probably looking at seed being probably 75% of your bird's intake. And during egg laying, then they're probably maximum consumption is about 20 grams of food per pair. So in my mind, if you look at that and think, okay, how much of soft food that my birds taking when they're breeding probably it's about five grams so for me that sort of 20 grams of food intake but a teaspoon of that is egg food soft food that's probably a realistic guess if you're going to try and guess actually the interesting thing when you're looking back at waltham um group, groups that they've done they actually had a study looking at um, birds that were given 30 grams of seed and 30 grams of rearing diet on a daily basis, looking at their voluntary food intake um, and comparing those two. And we do know on the basis of this Waltham studies that were done that that maximum intake of 20 grams and it's about 25% was the ballpark of what they had uh, from their studies too. So it, it kind of is a Again, it, it, it's, you know, back of a fag packet um, things here, but, but kind of a reasonable ballpark. So again, this was done decades ago, funded by the BS, and nobody ever knew about it. Um, and like I say, if we look down here, um, the bit I've highlighted going through this paper, it says the birds of the Waltham Avery have, for limited periods, increase their daily food intake to 20 grams per bird um, and that really is this was in the pairs that were rearing a minimum of three chicks at peak rearing the interesting thing that they did do which i think is my next slide this is the next slide they've done this is actually looking at um, daily energy intake of a rearing pair of birds and the stages at which they were taking increased energy and day a here is the first chick that hatched and we can see their consumption during incubation the first are catching negligible um, you've got here day 36 here um, when you've got the first chick hatching so during the egg laying process nutrition doesn't change but you can see the nutrition intake progressively increases right to the point when the birds fledge which is point c here and then their intake actually plummets down um which clearly the babies are starting to take the food themselves at that point pretty much you know literally within two or three days of fledging the parents are like yeah i've had enough now um but you can see obviously your consumption here is maxing out with that rearing process but their average intake is eight to twelve grams overall um per bird um which obviously then peaks around the 20 grams. So again, going back to that, 
they're probably taking 20 grams a pair, five grams of which is a teaspoon of soft food. That's probably a realistic ballpark that we're going to get. And I'm going to put a caveat in here. This is for birds that are trained and used to feeding on that soft food because they fledged and ate it themselves, or the hens particularly, which we're concerned about here. Um, the point here as well, just to read a bit from it, is Budrigars in our aviary at Waltham are known to have individual food preferences as well as individual patterns of feeding behaviour. Um, it must be remembered that these birds are often slow to accept novel foods and may take up to two weeks before their intake increases to a point where it is of any nutritional value. In other words, if you're trying a new food, you've got to throw it at them for two weeks before they actually do any change in that. Um, this process can be affected by early dietary experience and budrigars will eat most readily the seeds given to them as chicks. So this is back from that Waltham paper on the studies they were doing, really pretty much reinforcing what I have gone through and said tonight. We need the bird, you breed your own hens, you train them to take the food you want them to take, they will feed it to the chicks. They will have better eggs and better chicks as a consequence. You buy in a new hen, never had the diet that you're feeding before, won't work suddenly decide to change your mind because the millers have recommended you feed X, isn't gonna work. So let's try and pull these things together and, and, and reach this, this unfortunate story to an end. If we want about 1% of the total dietary intake to be calcium, and we're making a leap of faith that they're gonna consume 20 grams per pair, ballpark, during rearing, um, we know that we don't want to be exceeding over 1.2% calcium, so we can overdo this. Um, but if we're looking at a bird's consuming 20 grams of food per pair, we want 1% in the diet as a whole, we know that a quarter of that diet is actually going to be the soft food because we've trained them to eat it, then realistically our calcium level we want in our soft food should be about 4%. If we're pitching at that as a ballpark level, we're probably going to meet the calcium requirements for egg laying, meet the calcium requirements for rearing um, during that period. We can rein back that calcium content a little bit in the non-breeding season because, of course, their, their requirements are reducing. But we can still feed the same food, so they're constantly getting exposed to it, constantly getting a supply. Um, and like I say, basically, we, we know that, that too high a calcium is a problem. So, like I say, putting this all together, we probably want 4% calcium in our soft food. And if you're going to try and plan that, 4% as fed I would put in here, if you're going to try and plan that, I kind of need to know the calcium concentration of the ingredients that I'm putting in there and if I'm using commercial products that don't have a nutrient analysis I'm going nowhere. What we do know is that eggshells are 94% calcium carbonate and in fact the most concentrated source of calcium that you can get is calcium carbonate and that's 40% calcium. This is limestone flour. And if you're looking at commercial products out there, and I'm picking on Nutribel here and Calcidus, the, these are uh, manufactured by a friend of mine, long-standing avian specialist, been, been doing it and fish for that matter for decades. Very reliable in terms of the veterinary market, the, the, the Vetarc range of products are the most massively used product on the, on the system here. You've got Nutribel on the left here, which is a, a high calcium vitamin D supplement, which we use clinically for the reptiles particularly. Calcium dust is a dusting powder, just straight calcium carbonate, but it's been branded in a lovely little packet and with a happy reptile sat on the front. And equally then you've got calcium carbonate you can buy here, a kilo bag here, kilo of calcium carbonate, I think is probably about three, four, five quid. Calcium dust is about seven quid and Nutribal is about nine quid, you know, so, but this is all limestone flour. Uh, if we look at some of the commercial foods out there in terms of what calcium levels we've got, we know seed has none, bread has none, carrots has none, the boiled egg without the shell has none. So a lot of the common things you might be chucking into your birds don't have calcium. 
okay, there is some vitamin D in, in egg. As like we said, that's that's one of the ways of trying to drive vitamin D into people. Um, and if we go and look at some of these here, if we want to try and get um, 0.9% calcium into um, our birds as a minimum, then we've got to look at what we're feeding alongside that. So if you were feeding, for example, calcium carbonate in that, but you were also feeding commercial egg food, then it might be your calcium carbonate level that you would need to add to this to get to that 4% magic target. You'd need 8% of your soft food to be calcium carbonate. Okay, so balancing that in, into simple mass for you, if you were feeding 500 grams of soft food, 40 grams should be calcium carbonate. Give you an idea, that's 50 grams of calcium carbonate there for you as well. Um, so, you know, if you're relying on products that don't have calcium, you're using bread, carrots, vegetables, boiled egg, these sorts of things that don't have any calcium in them, then your calcium carbonate is the sole calcium cause for your birds, and that should be 10% of the mixture. Now, I guess at, at, at an instance, I'm probably going to be recommending if you're going to put calcium carbonate in for your birds, probably stick up 5% of your soft food, simply because at the minute, I don't know what other calcium sources you're feeding, whether you're giving uh, you know, UV light, whether you're giving calcium in the water as well. You might be chucking cuttlefish and grit, hoping probably completely wasting your time and money on that, that that's going to make a difference. And obviously, as we said, we don't want to overload on calcium. But even if you're looking at 5% of your mixture, you're still talking 50 grams per kilo. Or in my case, I'm using, like I say, 10% in that mix. I'm using 100 grams per kilo. Now, okay, that might mean I'm going to get through a kilo of soft food in maybe a couple of nights as fed, maybe every three nights, maybe every four nights. You're going to get a fair bit of wastage, I guess. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is if you want to get the calcium level right, it's actually a fair amount of calcium you need to add. And if I'm adding 50 grams a day and I've just spent 10, 12 quid for a 100 gram tub, that's quite a big add-on if I'm using a commercial calcium supplement that's been marketed like Nutribat. We do have to think about vitamin D as well. Um, that is essential as well. And if we go back again, looking at our hand rearing diets, the egg foods, NRC recommendations, minimum for poultry for laying eggs, things like this, this gives us a very good idea of what vitamin D levels are we need in our budgie diets as well. They need this to absorb the calcium in the first place. Hand rearing foods, vitamin D, uh, 1,500 international units per kilo. Egg foods here. Um, what egg food brand is this? I can't remember what egg food brand this is. Now this is one I was feeding my birds year before last. But vitamin D here, 1,400 I use per kilo. Um, NRC recommendations here for laying hens. A kilo of diet is pitching in down here at 500. Okay, we know hens will tolerate massive levels of vitamin D. Okay, and the recommended, recommended minimum level for a bird at rest is around 300 I use per kilo. Um, again, another paper here, age old paper, uh, looking at nutrient requirement of budgerigars in here, looking at how to get vitamin D into them. Um, and again, you know, some of these are very aged research because there just isn't the research done in the birds. Um, but the recommendation here was adding 1% of a high grade uh, cod liver oil to the sea to get vitamin D in, which of course is a great idea. 1% uh, would be 10 mils per kilo of seed. Um, which, okay, that's a good starting point, I guess. Um, we look at the Wharton paper here. This is great here. This is this is referenced now in in the in the press as well. Um, Baker here suggested a daily requirement of 25 milligrams of a bird for for vitamin D. That's less than one mill of cod liver oil to each kilo of seed. If the birds do not have access to direct sunlight, well, it's like well, that's just a tenth of the dose that the last paper just told me. Interesting. 
But you think, oh, hang on a minute. Well, look, I, this, this, this is reference number seven. Great. Here's reference number seven used in the Waltham paper. Dangers in vitamin overdose, a throwaway comment in Cajun Avery Birds in 1990. No evidence, no science. It's just laundered its way into the literature. But that's the way a lot of things go. But cod liver oil is readily available. Okay, it's not necessarily overly pleasant tasting per se, but it's readily available. You can buy it in litre lots. I can get a litre of that for probably 15 quid. Um, so if you're looking at wanting to uh, get vitamin D and calcium into your birds and make it economical, if cod liver oil works, okay, we don't know that. We have a few suggestions, but we don't have any definitive evidence. I can add the cod liver oil to match the sort of level that I'd like to get the right levels of vitamin D along with my calcium carbonate. Looking at cod liver oil on seed, seed is dehusked. Okay, if you add it to seed, they will dehusk the seed, the cod liver oil falls away. So how much they ingest is quite limited. If I add this to soft food, I can get it in there better. I know I want about one and a half thousand international units per kilo diet. That's the poultry diets. That's the parrot diet such as Harrison's. That's the soft food. That's the hand rearing diets. This is my pitch that I'm going for. Cod liver oil of a high quality has masses of vitamin D in it. Okay, 90 international units per mil. If I'm working on the premise my soft food is a quarter of that bird's diet and is relying on all of the vitamin D levels that bird needs, then I need four times that in that soft food to make it work. That's translating that across is 17 mils per kilo of soft food if you were solely reliant on your cod liver oil. Now, okay, I'm probably suggesting pitching in a 10 to, again, avoid the concerns of toxicity, but that does match that old paper again, trying to use some logic in terms of does that seem about right? So from a vitamin D point of view, probably 10 mils of cod liver oil into your soft food um, and 50 to 100 grams per kilo of calcium carbonate into your soft food, which the birds are trained to eating, should solve your problem. And if you're worried you might be a bit deficient in that, stick a UV light on the side of them because that is not going to encourage toxicity and that will compensate. So if we're looking at calcium metabolism in the birds, basically seed is rubbish. There is no calcium, no vitamin D. Your best chance of getting calcium and vitamin D into your birds on a reliable basis is in your soft food. Your birds need to be trained to eat it from the moment they fledge. You give it all year round. We're gonna pitch in at about 4% level for your calcium level in your soft food. And if you're gonna use calcium carbonate, which is the most calcium dense product out there, you want a 10% inclusion rate. Vitamin D, 6,000 IUs in the soft food, get cod liver oil into them. And if you can get them exposed to UVB, that's also brilliant. Okay. Uh, Sam Wilde said, uh, I think really you've already answered this, but I'll, I'll read it out anyway, because it's on here. Is calcium best in feed or water? You've already said in your final uh, bit that's best in the soft food, yes? We don't know is the honest answer to that, um, because the studies haven't been done in budgies to confirm or negate that. My concern within water is, I guess, twofold. One is, is if you put something in the water, the birds go, not drinking that, don't like it. Um, and the second thing you've got, of course, is if you're providing it intermittently in the water, which you will be, maybe you're doing it once a week, maybe you're doing it twice a week, because of the rate of calcium turnover in those hens laying eggs, they don't have the bone stores the medullary bone, which basically is a store for the next egg, they have to replenish that before they lay another one. So much as you might give them plenty of calcium on day one and they store up their medullary bone ready to go, any excess calcium beyond that, they won't absorb, they'll excrete it. 
they lay an egg, deplete the medullary bone, and in 48 hours, they're like, where's my more calcium? Well, you want you to put it in the water again for another five days. So for me, there is no logic in in-water treatment unless you're doing it every day for your laying hens. Yeah. And you won't be because of water palatability or cost or concerns of vitamin D toxicity because most of your calcium supplements in water contain vitamin D as well. Um, and you'll probably want to run some Abidec through them or 30 vit or whatever else you happen to want to throw at them as well. So in water at best, even if it is absorbed, will be intermittent and the birds need a continuous supply of calcium. Vitamin D they can store a little bit for short times, um, but not for any great length of time, because again, there are species that are exposed to UV light daily. Why have a system evolved to store vitamin D when I've got so much UV light, I don't know what to do with it. So these are things that need a continuous sustained input, not intermittent. And that's why I think in water is due to fail. Okay. Um, yeah, there are, there are a few questions that came up early and, and you have answered them. So it's really not, not you know, no point in going over them again. Um, but Matt Owens said, could you put hand rearing food into your soft food? Yes. Obviously you could, but is it, is it a worthwhile thing to do? Yes and no. Um, your nutritional profile of your hand rearing foods match your nutritional profile of your egg foods pretty much as, as, as we showed on the nutrient analysis. So an egg food to lower cost, to be honest, than the hand rearing foods. The trouble is here, what we're looking at here, and this is, I suppose, is the difference between getting, you know, if you're looking at feeding hand rearing food as a sole dietary source, that's nutritionally balanced. We know that, that works beautifully. But if I feed that as a small part of the diet and the rest is deficient, it's never ever going to be good enough to compensate because it's not concentrated enough, if that makes sense. So, you know, even if you're, you used your hand rearing, your, your soft food was 75% hand rearing food, if they're still eating three quarters of the diet as seed, you're still massively deficient. So whatever you add into your soft food or whatever you make your soft food to be, ballpark figure has to be four times what we'd like the overall diet to be because seed hasn't got any of the stuff that we want. Okay, protein energy aside, but you know, what we're looking at here is from a calcium and vitamin D point of view, seed's got nothing, There's nothing to offer on this table at all. So I am totally reliant on that soft food. And if that's a quarter of their diet, I need it to be four times as strong to compensate for the three quarters that it's not. So much as your hand rearing food will improve your soft food, it's never ever going to get good enough because it's not designed for that. And to be honest, it's probably quite an expensive way of doing it. Now, okay, if I'm gonna to top up my chicks with it, if I've got chicks that are struggling, topping them up with the hand rearing food is better than nothing. Um, and would work fine again, but you're still, you're trying to just progressively improve it. But I don't think there's any merit in adding it to soft food. I, I think it's, a, it's a, an expensive thing to put in that, and it's not going to compensate in the way that you might think it would. Thank you very much. Um, the question you're talking about seed being really lacking, what about if that seed has been sprouted? Is it any, any more beneficial I know it's more beneficial for certain things like maybe protein, but what, is there any more calcium in, in the sprouted seed? None. Nope. Yeah, let's answer that one then, thank you. Um, Mark Turner, uh, I, I think you, confused, you might confuse him a little bit. Please ask Kevin to explain the 0.85 calcium, 0.85% uh, calcium is it, and how we make sure our birds get it. Okay, so your 0.85% is basically what's been, I guess, calculated, guessed, largely worked out as maintenance levels of calcium for a bird that's not laying eggs, not rearing. We know that seed has a tenth of that, so that's deficient. Now, okay, this bird isn't going to try and lay an egg tomorrow. It's not producing lots of medullary bone or raising chicks. So maybe you might get away with more intermittent dosing because it's not growing, it's not 
you know, it, it's got no major dramatic changes in terms of calcium requirement relative to birds that are breeding or rearing or rapidly growing chicks. Um, but my recommendation for that is if you're going to try and create a food, and I guess it's a question of what you want to call it, whether you want to call it a soft food, a hand rearing food, a balancer, um, to compensate for seed deficiencies, you need to train your birds to take that on a daily basis. So I will be offering whatever food you want to offer them every day. But the consistency or the amount of calcium in that, you can rein that back because they're not breeding. So you're probably looking at maybe instead of have, wanting to pitch in at 4% calcium for something that is rearing or egg laying, maybe you're going to be wanting to pitching in more like something along the lines of 3% or something in that soft food. In other words, you can reduce back your vitamin D probably. You can reduce back your calcium. You certainly can reduce back protein, for example, in that food to a maintenance level but they're still getting it trickling through. They're still accepting it as part of the routine diet. You think, great, my hens are gonna start laying soon. I paired them up. I wanna start driving now their calcium content. Now I'm gonna change that soft food. I'm gonna push the relevant constituents of that to get them ready for egg laying. And you take it up a notch from then on. So for me, whatever soft food you're feeding, feed it continuously, just modify its content based on what your birds are doing. Thank you. Our next question is um, it's from Tony Pringle and he says, uh, does too much calcium affect the fertility of cockbirds? No. Too much calcium will produce, reduce productivity as a whole and can cause problems and disease problems. And that's really where we're pitching in here, looking at the poultry industry, where you don't want to be creeping beyond the 1.2% as a whole in the diet. Um, which is why we're sort of pitching around the 1% as a reasonable sort of figure. Um, but yes, you don't want to be going up over the 1.2, but it's not going to be cause a specific cause for infertility in the cot. But if you're, if you're overfeeding calcium massively, you're going to have a wide range of issues, not just, you know, how many fertile eggs they create. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Tony Pringle asks, uh, does oxalate in spinach stop calcium absorption yes and this is this is the problem that we've then got is depending on what you're feeding uh, you know alongside that is you've got what's called phytates and a lot of um, brassicas and, and, and things like that that will bind calcium which reduces its availability to be absorbed so much as things for example like spinach are very high calcium they're also high in phytates. You, you just can't absorb the calcium from them. So what range of fresh produce you add to your soft food dramatically influences what the availability of your calcium is. And therefore, you've got to critically look at what you're adding and why you're adding it. Thanks, Kevin. Well, on there. Um, are there any, uh, apart from spinach, are there any other problem ones? Like I've heard that broccoli is not a good one to uh, feed. Um, broccoli isn't a good one to feed actually there's a there's a beautiful paper which, which um, I was going to talk about perhaps other aspects of nutrition of the night but there's a lovely paper looking at birds that were fed on a seed diet uh, and the only real supplements they were getting were, were broccoli uh, and those birds actually ended up having massive issues with iodine deficiency and goiter as a consequence of that diet um, mass mortality and infertility in them on a seed diet with broccoli as one of their main veg that they were getting. Um, so yes, there's lots of anti-nutrient factors is what we would call them in vegetables and things because vegetables don't want to be eaten if that makes sense. Um, they can't run away. So, um, you know, to some extent palatability and, and, and uh, um, anti-nutrient factors there are an impact in that. So, you know, singling out one type of vegetable or, or fruit to feed um, okay fruit's a different story they ignore fruit because they do want to be eaten but if you're talking out from a veg point of view having one singular item that you're using is probably a bad thing when I say when I have a consistent diet I want a consistent varied diet if that makes sense uh not a varied inconsistent diet oh it's how you word it John nice yeah. variety but the same variety every day yeah so mix and match, really. If you're gonna, whatever you're gonna feed, just make sure you feed lots of other things as well. Yeah. 
feed a nice variety but feed the same day in day out feed the same thank you uh, david holland has asked why is it when out of say out of a clutch of two one of them's got splayed legs and the other chick hasn't and that has been on the same food depends on what the hen's feeding to some extent um and age of chick um because obviously they're going to be different ages anyway and just because you have some that are more clinically affected than others doesn't mean to say they don't all have the problem when you look at the um gray parrots for example you know we'll get birds coming through that have been sold as normal birds that you'll find signs of metabolic bone disease in radiographically that, that have been an, an detected by the owners because they thought the bird was normal going right the way through to birds that are completely distorted so um you know you're not going to get everybody affected with the same severity at the same time um and that boils down to what the hen is feeding and um i think to be fair that again it boils down to hen preference i guess and also the variability in soft food that people feed because i, I think people that are feeding soft food there's lots of them that aren't feeding the same every day. They vary it on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, because birds will get bored if you feed them the same soft food, I guess, which, which they won't. Okay, thank you. Um, Pete, Pete Smith uh, has asked, what about oyster shell in the grit? Okay. In calcium? So there is actually some work looking at um, oyster shell in chickens and using oyster shell in you know, chicken start actually did improve the, the calcium content of the shells in the hens that were laying um, quite nicely. Um, I guess the question we've got, uh, and much as I think oyster shell is okay, um, I mean you'd argue that even cuttlefish is okay, my question to you is are they eating it? Are they eating it consistently? Uh, across the board and I think we'd all agree that when you're looking at the use of gritting birds or cuttlefish the intake is very variable across pairs some will devour it others will ignore it we know that grit isn't needed from a nutritional point of view in terms of digestion of um, food um, and I guess for me if I wanted to get calcium in a reliable format soft food wins so my birds don't have grit because you don't need it to grind stuff in their gizzard because they're not eating whole seeds, they're deshelling them. So your grit, really, the only purpose you've got grit for is to give them calcium. But if I've got finely milled calcium carbonate, which I know is good bioavailability, and I can add it into the soft food and hide it in there, then that's solved my problem. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was going to miss out on Tanya's question because it's sort of been answered, but... Uh, Kevin Pestle sort of brought it up again because he's seen me, he's seen me go, go past it. And, and Tanya said, can we overdose on calcium? Kevin said um, he'd like to know, he'd like an answer to Tanya's question because he's always been told you can't overdose calcium as the birds will excrete it, the unwanted calcium. They do. Um... I guess it, it reaches a saturation point. So all, pretty much all, not, not every species, pretty much all of your mammalian avian species and reptiles to some extent, the system that regulates your calcium is your vitamin D system. Um, so you're not gonna absorb more than you need because your vitamin D will regulate that. If you are pushing vitamin D high in these birds and giving them plenty of calcium, then yes, they will absorb excess. So to some extent, it's a combination of vitamin D and calcium coming through in high levels that you need to create a toxicity more than straight calcium in its own right per se. And we have to be honest when we're looking at calcium metabolism in the birds at the minute, even what I'm presenting tonight, I'm guessing, this is anecdote, I don't know. I'm just trying to make an, an, an evidence-based choice uh, for what I think would be appropriate. But we actually, bottom, bottom line is, we don't actually know because the research hasn't been completed yet. Thank you. Matt Owens asks, he, he feeds carrots, peas and sweet corn. Are they okay? Yes. Yes. Right, thank you. And then uh, Mark Turner's got the next question. Please ask Kevin, 
what vegetables he would recommend to add to the soft food and what calcium supplements he would add to that. I think we've got to be honest that most of your fruit and veg, they're, they're, they have lots of benefits in, in terms of vitamin content and things, which again, it wasn't really a topic for tonight. But the fact of the matter is, is most of those don't have the calcium content that you need into that. So most of your veg out there, whatever you're choosing, the calcium input's going to be fairly low, if that makes sense. So in most cases, whether it be peas, whether it be broccoli, whether it's going to be whatever going in there, um, the calcium content's pretty poor. Um, and if you want to find out the calcium content, then there are loads and loads of um, sites online looking at human nutrition where people just say how much calcium is in, in a sprig of broccoli they will tell you you can find that out um, so to some extent you're using those in there for maybe a more variation in the diet vitamin content certainly palatability for example if your birds are used to taking peas and sweet corn then they'll take peas and sweet corn um, protein content a lot of these is is okay but not massive um, so in most cases, the veg you're adding, providing you're adding it at a set amount, is literally increasing moisture content, increasing palatability, um, but not that reliant on calcium. So if you want to drive your calcium, as I said, I, I look for around the 4% in the soft food as a, as a guide for you. Um, there's loads of supplements out there. Most of them are calcium carbonate based. Um, and you either go for calcium carbonate or you go for something that, that's like Nutribal, for example, that's out there. There, there. There's loads of them on the market. It's just a question of which I guess is your preferred choice. Um, what I would be encouraging you to do is choose a product where you've actually got the amount of calcium carbonate in that product, which is going to be the calcium source in that product anyway. So you can try and work out how much you need to add to make sure you're getting the right amount of calcium going in. So you kind of do need a nutrient analysis on that so and say, how much calcium do you have? Because I've got to make sure I add just about the right amount. And there are products out there that you don't. And, and when we were chatting about earlier on this week was the Murphy's Pro system, which dad and I used to use years and years ago forever. And it looks a good product, but there's no label on it telling me how much calcium it's got in it or how much anything else it's got in it. And that is a hampering factor in terms of working out how much you add. Um, I think it's a good thing, but I just wish I had more information to be able to say, okay, I would add X amount per amount of soft food or X amount in whatever versus a generic give them some. Um, your cheapest calcium source is calcium carbonate. Okay, thank you. Um, well, while talking about that, you were talking about uh, earlier on about ways of getting the calcium into your birds. So uh, that that brings up a good, uh, just a thought from me that he, whatever whatever veggies you're feeding, let's say it's only those three that uh, that Mark brought up. If you if your birds are on those three and they're eating it then surely a, a, a good way then is to add your calcium carbonate to those three veg. And while they're eating those three veg, they're going to get the calcium, aren't they? And of yes. course, I presume you're going to say it's difficult to know how much they're going to get. It, it is, and we're guessing. We're, we're, we're trying to make a, a, an educated guess, I suppose. Um, the thing is, is calcium carbonate isn't tasty. Um, I think that's something we have to be, be, be aware of. Um, and as we said, birds lack the wisdom to know what they need to eat, same as we do. Um, you know, those of you that are having uh, heartburn, which I was having horrendous heartburn until I took Ezomeprazole. Um, you know, one of your main products for quality. Don't shake your head at me, George. This is this is a this is a perfectly valid tangent. Um, you know that they're calcium carbonate based. You know, and you know they are just chalky and like. Ugh. You know, you have to have something that at least is a semblance of fruit flavour to make it palatable. Um, so this is the difficulty you've got is you're trying to get something into them which they might not want to take. So mixing it with something that's more palatable and getting it finely milled into a mix, your chances of uptake is far greater. And like I say, carrot and everything else is brilliant. The interesting thing we have with um, the reptiles now if we go just go off to a tangent now where we get lots of calcium problems where calcium carbonates used quite widely 
um, with those who actually end up, we, we gut load the, the invertebrates. So we, we feed the um, crickets, whatever you're feeding, a very, very high calcium content of diet. that's actually fatal to the cricket. Um, but you feed it so much that it has a belly full of calcium. And then before it carks it of calcium or vitamin D toxicity, you feed it to the uh, lizard and the lizard gets a better deal. Uh, the other way of doing that is we dust them. And what you basically do is, and again, those of you that keep soft bills or, or, or passerines, uh, not the canaries per se, but other ones, you'll, you'll be familiar with dusting your live prey before you're feeding it to those individuals. Um, and dusting works to a, te to, a, to a point, but if you're given the choice between a dusted cricket and a non-dusted cricket to your lizards or to your birds, they choose the non-dusted one every time because the dusted ones, they just have this dry, claggy powder on the top. So we know it's not something they would choose to eat. So we have to get it into them in a secret way and train them to take it and soft food's the way forward. Thank you. Brian Iwood's uh, asking, um, it, it just had two chicks dead in shell, fully developed and, uh, and obviously didn't hatch. Um, <laughs> I suppose as we're talking about calcium, I, I should say, well, could it be a calcium problem? I think, yes. I think, to be honest, my main concern with calcium in terms of your risk factors for dead in shell or embryonic mortality, I think I'm more concerned with eggshell quality um, that's coming through. And I think you'll all be very familiar with hens that are laid. The first egg seemed to be okay, second egg okay, third egg, oh, that looks a bit porous, fourth egg smashed. You know, this is a very common thing that you'll be seeing, particularly in older hens. So my main concern, I think, in terms of calcium, in terms of hatchability is, is the eggshell quality my hens are laying, are they good looking, solid looking eggs or can I see through them or are they porous uh, or are they coming out and smashing on the floor or this sort of type of thing or in the nest box. So I think for me, I wouldn't put this down as a, oh my God, it's a, a cause for a dead in shell. I mean, it will be. My greater concern here is it's a cause for egg loss early in that egg laying cycle or eggs you have to throw out after a few days because the egg is just not of acceptable quality because your hen is deficient from the get-go. And if you count up in a season how many eggs you're maybe going to throw away because of that, or how many hens you get egg-bound that are taken out of a breeding cycle for a month or six weeks, or how many you lose, what if we could help reduce that amount? What if instead of losing 20 eggs a year, you lost five? That, you know, that, that could be potentially viable chicks. That, that's, you know, this is all about trying to maximise our... our output from birds that are getting with the best in the world increasingly hard to breed um, if this helps get better egg quality coming through and maintains that viability of that egg such that the chick can hatch great but i think for me the, the calcium is affecting their mortality much earlier than, than than that because we're looking at eggs that are wildly off the, the scale in terms of drying out too quick because the shell's too porous due to poor calcium content uh, thank you. Uh, what have we got then? Um, 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 um. Um, have you used? Uh, have you looked at that product called the uh, Fraser Form? Because uh, Matt Owens has said that he uses Fraser Form in in his soft food, and what advantage there is. Well, obviously, you would have had to have looked at it to know that. Is that something you've looked? At? I haven't looked at it. No, um, I do know that a, a lot of people. Uh, use a Fraser form and we used to use Hormoform repeatedly in the birds you know we used to mix that with the Murphy's Pro minerals actually as it happened uh, I know it's very popular but I haven't actually looked at the nutrient analysis of that I think somebody did send it to me actually maybe um, but it does boil down to what you you think you your birds should be taking um, I guess my argument is is emulate a hand rearing product emulate an egg food that's a good benchmark and then you've got to look at the nutrient analysis of what you want to feed on top of that to work out and try and come up with something that that approximates that and that's why why i'm i harp on about if you if you're using products that don't have a nutrient analysis freely available don't use them because they're either they're just completely unreliable 
um, and you've got no justification for what claims are being made against the product. And the bigger companies who are doing the nutrient analysis have products that have been used repeatedly year in, year out. You know, these diets work. We know they work for larger citizens, so let's just emulate it. It's a good starting point for trying to improve our bird's diet, given we know we're doing something stupid. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tanya's asked a question. She said, when the shell is too thick, um, does this mean that the hens are getting too much calcium? Normally, if you've got a shell that's increased in thickness, that's normally more associated with it being um, held in the oviduct for too long a time period. Um, so they have the your egg spends the bulk of its time down in the magnum part of the oviduct, which is where the eggshell and albumin is sort of created and laid down. So if it's if for whatever reason it's delayed in transit then you can get extra calcium laid down at that point because transit hasn't been as quick as possible. Maybe the hen had some dystocia, maybe there's some oviduct infection or something. So normally your excessively thick shells are due to, due to the transit or production of that egg more than blaming calcium per se in the diet. Right, thank you. We've got a very clever question here from our, uh, one of our juniors, Lila, and she says, in the wild, how, how do these birds go about getting their calcium? The budgies in the wild, how do they get their calcium? So we have the same argument, uh, identical arguments with the, with the reptile keepers as well. You know, you have an insectivorous reptile that's living perfectly fine in the wild. You bring it into captivity and you feed it insects and all of a sudden it has loads of issues with calcium metabolism. You have budgies, they're granivores, they eat seed in the wild. We bring them into captivity, we feed them seed. Why are we having issues when they don't in the wild? Um, and the answer, to be honest, to both those is, 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 is identical. One, they've got access to natural UV, which we're not providing. Um, two, their dietary sources they're looking at is a wide variety of seeds from calcium rich soils um so the calcium content of a you know if you're looking at calcium content of veg or anything um you can vary the calcium content in that plant product by what soil it's got in the first place um so the nutritional value of wild seeds wild invertebrates in a, in a mixed variety over intensively raised crops or artificially raised captive invertebrates is massively massively different and that's why because it, it's like we're making our birds take a monoculture of just white millet or maybe rather than playing canary as well but you're talking a very limited range of products mass crop produced for productivity versus wild foraging for seeds different sources better calcium uh, from a soil point of view and natural uv as well so that's why we're having the issues is our birds are on a natural diet right. okay thank you um james wheeler asks is there any medication which may influence the absorption of calcium. Obviously, he knows about vitamin D, but is there anything else that can help with the absorption of that? So the the products that 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 we would use in a clinical setting for an egg-bound hen or for one with soft-shelled eggs. Um, the, a lot of the liquid calcium supplements, the one I put up was Zolcal, for example, but you could have calcium it onto that list. There's also lots of products out there for people as well marketed because of course calcium metabolism problems in older uh, females of our species is quite a problem as well so there's a number of calcium and vitamin d supplements marketed for there as well and as we said you know we know that vitamin d deficiency is quite a common human issue as well george probably suffering the worst out of everybody here um just because he's so far north and there's no uv in scotland apart from the last few days when it's been quite a lot um but so there's loads of products out there from the human side there's loads of products out there from the veterinary side and obviously loads of products commercially as well so certainly for me if i was having a hen that was egg bound soft shelled eggs 
or I'd spotted that egg number three looked a bit like, oh, you haven't got quite enough calcium there. There is a logic in ramping up for that one particular hen because she's struggling. And then you're down to, you could crop tube some of the liquid calcium supplements directly into a crop, do it that way. Um, you know, okay, if you were really enthusiastic and you had a vitamin D supplement, then you could, you know, drop a bit onto the back of a mouth. That would also do. And I do know some breeders do do that as well. Um, that's not a crisis. I wouldn't think you need to do that as a routine because if you get your diet right, you shouldn't need to. But if you've got one hen who maybe is taking less soft feed or is an older hen or she's struggling mobilizing her calcium just because she's a bit old and knackered, fine, catch her up, give her something by mouth, top her up, help her out. Because what I don't want is that egg that's come through that's been a bit dodgy to be a soft shelled egg next time, a mobile duck prolapse and an egg bound hen. I'd rather step in now and help her. So for me, if you're seeing that in a hen, step up your game to help her because you want to make sure that she's okay longer term because we wouldn't want a hen to have reproductive problems because of calcium anyway. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, George has been doing a little bit of detective work on the net and he's found there is no nutritional info on Fraser form on the website. Um, that obviously has no nutrient value at all then, clearly. Well, as far as you're concerned, that's, that's correct because you'd say don't use it because you don't know what's in it, obviously. You can't really argue with that, can you? But uh, there you go. No, I mean, I, the question I suppose I've got is, and I'm not, I'm not saying it's of, of no use, don't get me wrong at all, but that, that's it. The question is, is, why isn't the data there then? Well, um, there's actually, not online, George, George. it's not online, um, but then Nick sent me a picture and then she sent me one of the back of the packet and it says um, 12% calcium. Okay. I have put in the files. Um, on the group chat for everyone to have a look at the picture for the whole thing. Yeah, great. Good job. Okay, so 12% all right. If we're pitching in at wanting four in our soft food, then that kind of means it needs to be about a third of our soft food. That's a hell of a lot to try and balance that out. So it's going to help. Uh, I, don't know. I haven't looked at the rest of it, but as far as calcium, yeah, you need a third of it in your soft food. So it's far too much. It's going to help. I don't. Okay, I haven't seen the nutrient analysis. Maybe other things in there are benefit. But that's the point that I'm trying to make: is is some of these products that are out there, you know, their perceived levels of what is good. Maybe it isn't, because you know we're looking at using this. We've got to find a way to balance the absolute appalling deficiencies in three quarters of our birds' diet. So what we're giving in the quarter has to be four times what we'd like to compensate for it and that's really why we're starting to look at ramping up and once you start looking at things like protein requirements it it just gets crazy trying to square it in your head given what we've got in, in other food sources so like i say I'm, I'm, i you know i know i've been sitting here picking on seed and, and the vet in me is like why the hell are you feeding bird seed that's crazy you get them on a complete pelleted diet and it works beautifully um, we know it does it's perfect but the fact of the matter is, is uh, at a conservative best guess, your food bill's just gone up fivefold. Realistically, it's probably gone up tenfold. We're not going to do it. So that's fine. But then we have to think logically about how we're going to try and help our birds um, sensibly with some hopefully rough idea of what's the right thing to do by them instead of just following what somebody else has said. Thank you. I know <laughs> recommendations is a. It was, <laughs> blimey, I, I'm going to get myself into trouble here. But I have to say that I think around about before Christmas, I think when we, if I remember rightly, and Nicky will put me right, we there was a period of time where we were suffering with with a calcium problem in in our eggs, and they were coming out. Too many of them were coming out rough. Yep. Which, you know, absorbing whatever, and they, they're obviously no good. And I can only tell you, I mean, I have tried a few other things as well, but since I've, I've been on the Fraser form, since around about Christmas time, I've not had one egg, anything wrong with it. So yeah. if that's a recommendation for everyone, you know, it worked, it worked for me. So anyway. I mean, it's a, it's a 12% calcium content, so it's going to help. Yeah. And we do know that if you take a pair of budgies and you feed them seed and you set them off breeding, they'll probably manage, and this is managing, for two rounds until they crash and burn. 
Yeah. On a on a calcium deficient diet, the the hen will just deplete her own resources to the point of collapse to to get those eggs laid. But if you want to maintain your viability and productivity for longer, then you've got to do something about that. So your Fraser form will be helping, John. Um, yeah. And I know that you like to add about 60 things to your soft food in various amounts, depending on the days of the week and, and which you, you, which one you won at which show, at which occasion, which was for the best in show award, which, you know, you won at Hastings with a cinnamon blue, which was an amazing bird, far better than any grey greens out there. Um, but, it was an amazing bird, actually. It was just, well, it was, was on the day. It was just the bird that, that did well on the day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only trying to wind people up. You know what I'm like. I can't help it. I can't help it. Yeah. But, Get it right. Um, Get it right. Colbert blue. Was it Colbert? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, the fact of the matter is, is it will be helping, John. Um, yeah. But again, we don't, you know, it, it's looking at what you're putting in collectively as a whole. And you might find that that phrase of form was enough to tip the scales in your balance because you weren't far off the mark anyway. Um, you know, for me, I, I'm solely reliant on my calcium carbonate. That is my calcium source for my birds, and that's it. Well, what I have done today, just for, um, I've just made some up, and I've decided because I, I do like to change things, <laughs> uh, and I've decided to whizzy woo it. So it's gone in the blender, uh, uh -huh. form with all the other stuff in it, because I want it even finer than it is, because yep. I want it to coat everything. So rather than it being picked out on its own, it's now going to coat everything that I feed in the soft food. So you have made a very good thing today, John. Well done. Yes, thank you. Um, now my, my, mine goes through the blender as well, which I've largely destroyed, much to my wife's annoyance. But you know, you want thorough mixing here. You want the birds. You don't want the birds to be able to pick out just the carrot or just the egg yolk or just something else. You know, you want that to be coated or mix thoroughly mixed with whatever you're adding to it. And, and that's really where you, you need to have a, a well-mixed soft food that stops that selective feeding within the soft food, if that makes sense. And that's where the sort of complete, you know, pelleted diets for the citizens work is they can't selectively feed. You know birds selectively feed. You'll have some pairs that will eat or play canary, or others that will eat all the millet. So they do the same with the soft food. So you've got to try and present it in such a way that they cannot pick and choose if they're going to eat the soft food, they get everything. And the finer that product is milled, the greater chance you've got of it sticking, the greater chance you're going to ingest it by accident. Yeah, that's, that's my uh, way my brain works. But and, and even back to the liquid calcium supplements, you know, jumping off to the side, if you were using those, if you are blending up your soft food and you've got that on a high spin and you're going to pour in some calcium you know the right amount of liquid calcium supplement into that mixture that's going to coat everything as well and it's going to do the same job as well so that's the other option and certainly that's what we're doing with the cod liver oil mine's in the blender and the cod liver oil the set amount that i want to give into that soft food is run through the blender to try and coat everything um to try and get a, a, an even spread you know in, in that mixture and, and that's really where you, you need to be looking at that and, and um you don't want chunks you want something that's consistent that they cannot selectively feed from. Right, okay. A couple more questions and then we're done, I think. Uh, Mark, Mark Turner said, talked about, it, we were saying about the, um, why in the wild that, you know, they're, they're eating seeds as their main diet and they're doing okay. So what are we doing wrong? We're using mono, monocultures that have been, been cultivated that, that, that don't have the same nutritional balance as a, a wild grown naturally grown seed well, yeah. okay there you go mark there you go uh where are we now um yeah james james wheeler who asked earlier on about um what medication could could help the absorption of calcium he said he was his concern was with regards to uh medications like antibiotics harpers four in one etc does that affect the absorption of calcium <laughs> No, um, you're obviously not going to mix it in the water, but no, it won't affect it if that makes sense. It's the brassicas that would. Calcium certainly will affect um, the absorption of certain drug therapies, which will be mentioned in our next instalment next month because it does impact on some antibiotics absorption. Um, but no, it would. Th those things wouldn't stop calcium being absorbed if that makes sense. Um, 
you won't be mixing in the water anyway in the same water because that would be crazy. Um, but no, they wouldn't impact on it. Okay. Uh, Dave Wyoms asked for us in the question here about bigger budges, do they need more calcium than smaller budges? Don't know. Um, your calcium content in feathers isn't a major issue. The protein is greater there, I suppose. Um, they are bigger. Um, I guess they're growing at a similar rate. No, we, we don't know is the answer to the, to the question. Um, I would probably be pitching at the same as I would do for any budgie. And I appreciate a lot of the, the studies we've looked at from Waltham, for example. They are, um, you know, birds that, that are different. I mean, most of the birds they were using were actually pet style birds. They weren't really exhibition birds even back then in the 1990s. So um, we are looking at, at um, birds that were physically quite quite different from the bigger birds of today and no we don't know if they have a greater calcium requirement um, and again a lot of what we're looking at here i'm making a judgment here from other citizens or making a judgment from chickens and this sort of type thing we, we don't really have lots of data on budgies as a whole let alone um, budgies of a specific size shape or variety for example which may be different so i guess my recommendation is is if you can try and pitch in at the levels we've suggested tonight around the four percent in your soft food that's probably a good starting point but as yet we don't know okay thank you to ask what um what are your thoughts on topping helping the the parents out topping up chicks maybe morning and and, and in particular at night with a good quality um uh you know, rearing mix like you showed us earlier so that you know they're going to get something that's good two two things going through my head uh with that um one is absolutely brilliant amazing idea if you've got a hen that's struggling it's nutritionally balanced we know it's what we want them to feed them okay it's not super feed if that makes sense but it won't do any harm and it's balanced so that's good second thing the liquid content is quite high on some of them. You can get a, a damper or, you know, messier nest associated with that. Um, third thing on my list with that would be, why are you topping them up? Um, if, you, if you are topping up, sorry, I've got a, a phone on the go here. Yeah, go on, answer it. I'll ring you in two minutes. Um, if you are um, topping up, the question is, why are you doing that? And if you're doing that because you've got nests with polyoma or things versus a hen that's just struggling, then I would encourage if you are going to go down that route, make it the last yeah, nest. Okay. Just make it. sure it's the last you nest you do that night so you're not, you know, tra transmit things across. There will be just one second. I'm going on mute. Who's on? Um... Right, yeah, it was only a couple, couple more questions and, uh, and we're, we're done, so. I the concerned with Kevin's ringtone there. Yeah, yeah, I thought so. It was getting louder and louder. Obviously, I was thinking, oh, someone's turning the radio up. And obviously, it was, the phone was getting nearer to, nearer to Kevin. Sorry, it was one of, sorry, one of the vets on call was, was struggling in terms of what they were, what they were doing. So they, they, um, but I think, they're, I think they're under control without my help. But I will oh, speak yeah. to them in a minute. Okay, so um, next. The next question. Oh, you, did you finish that? Yeah, I think you did, didn't you? Really? You finished that? Yeah. Think so. Yeah. Um, the next question is: um, uh, we, we talked a lot about UV light and you know having it nice and close, like within twelve inches. Um, is it worth mentioning about red eyes and and, and possible damage, for maybe for one or two of our members that might not know? Yeah. Um... So UV light, much as I said, it's not going to cause any, any issues with vitamin D uh, toxicity. Um, you do have issues um, with corneal damage is one of the routes that you do get. If you get exposed to things like UVC, which is the sort of light that's used for irradiating products, for example. So some of your higher end um, UV sources that we use for the reptiles, for example, have actually had 
spilling into the UVC light output and of course significant damage leading to some products being um, withdrawn from the market. The level of lighting that we're using for the, the birds is not going to risk that because it's much lower level but the concern that we do have with the red eyes where you're naturally lacking pigment and this goes for you know even even down to looking at the things like your fallows, your enos and lace wings same as albinism in any species really or you you've got the concern that they don't have the pigmentation necessary to protect them from uv and some of those species might be more sensitive to uv from lights and again we don't know the studies haven't been done as to whether they need just one hour a day as opposed to 12 hours a day or or whether we should be looking at avoiding it completely um, and again we don't know uh, about those individuals whether that should be a, a modification in, a, in recommendations for that i suspect being honest nobody's particularly using uv in their birds anyway to any great degree um, but i think we would be potentially cautious regarding those ones as well yes kevin can i come on to that Right, yep. Well, Ian Fordham, not Ian Fordham, Lutinos. Um, I'm just going to, I've got to plug in some power because I'm, I'm dying of battery, but I'm going to keep, keep talking, talking to okay. you. Well, Ian Fordham and myself, I was doing very well with albinos. I had 10 years breeding of albinos. And we both started using UV. Now, we didn't know that. We didn't know that we were both at the same time. Uh, and over a, a, a four to five year period, right, um, we started then to get older birds that were over two year old, three year old particularly, that were going blind. Yep. And at the end of the day, and we got no science behind this, we can only, I can only say, and Ian would agree with me, yep. that, that when we did speak to each other, as we do sometimes, um, we both found that we got UV problems after three years, uh, sorry, we got blindness, we believe caused from too much UV. We were both using UV. No question that if you look at the birds, it makes them more vibrant, etc. But it and it wasn't as close as you were saying. You were talking about twelve inches. These were in the aviaries for the main lighting. Um, but we had blindness of birds over two year old, and that obviously knocked out our older, you know, parenting birds. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it normally has to be quite close. You, you know, to get a, a reasonable amount of UVB, it's got to be within the 12 inches. Um, now, whether UVA would have an effect, I'd be, be less likely to think that UVA would have an effect in its own right, because obviously the tubes are producing UVB are producing UVA concurrently. Um, and certainly UVA is very widely used in certainly sort of uh, aquariums for improving the visual appearance of the fish for example it, it penetrates through water quite nice so all of your aquarium lighting are all full spectrum plus uva outputs with no uvb i'm going on a tangent here um but you know we do know for example that uva does stimulate reproductive activity in birds as a whole and birds can see in the uva spectrum so if you were going to put lighting in, I probably would encourage to put UVA as general lighting as well. Um, I don't really have an explanation for you, Ian, as, as to why. Um, normally the effects are fairly immediate with UVB and it has to be close to them. This was over a two, three year period that we found the problem. But I agree 100%. If you get particularly like a green and UV light is shining on that green, it is a totally different green to the colour that we personally see. Yes. And the, the, the thing is to be aware of as well, it is um, we can't see in the U, we can't see UV, um, whereas the birds can. And so when you're looking at why the starlings know to, um, you know, steal the, the grapes off your grapevine the day before you do is, is they're seeing the UV fluorescent and we can't see it. That's why they're choosing it. Same way that, that budgies, you know, cheek patches for us under UV. Nobody ever sees that because we can't see that. But with the UV lighting in your shed, the birds will see it because they can see UVB. Well, and UVA. 
But yes, finally, yes, I agree. Be careful with Enos because their eyes are much more sensitive. I would be careful with them, yes, absolutely. Um, but again, no real science behind it, but it's a well-known feature of all albino species. They're lacking the, the melanin, and that is one of the protective pigments against excessive UV, and they don't have it. So I would be cautious with those, yes. No, I would like to add that it will also affect uh, lace wings. Now, whether that's because of the, some people think it's half Lutino, and maybe that's why they're, they're suffering, I don't know. But either way, I know, I know they do suffer. Um, one thing I don't know, though, do, do cinnamons suffer with it at all? And I, I've never heard of it. I just wonder, being a, I know they're not a red eye, but a plum eye halfway there. I think it depends on, you know, in terms of, you know, melanin mutations or, or lack thereof, you've got complete albinism right the way through to a variety of leukistic forms. It all boils down to how much pigment they've got. Um, certainly, I think there's very good reason to be concerned with the fallows. Um, cinnamons, I wouldn't have thought so. I've never seen it in, in, in any of the mainstream. That said, my fallows have all got UV directly on top of them as have, have the albinos and the crested. Um, but I think for, for, for the fallows and the enos specifically, I would be more cautious. For the re remaining ones, I wouldn't have any issue at all with giving them UV. But you're going to struggle to do that in a wooden cage. Um, and certainly even with the parrots, we sometimes struggle with the, the UV as well, getting it to them and forcibly exposing it to them. Because if you're looking at a parrot in, a, in an aviary, it's not going to suddenly decide to sit under the UV light all day long. And if your hen's spending all day long in the nest box and she's sitting in there for a week or 10 days, then again, her UV exposure is, is minimal. So, you know, a lot of the studies that have been done looking at the benefits of UV, you do kind of have to force the animals to sit under it for a bit to quantify the effect, because again, they're not going to necessarily choose to sit under it. And that, also makes life difficult for using UV as a sole source. So to some extent, you are looking at a belt and braces situation here. We know we can have difficulties getting adequate calcium and vitamin D in. We know that UV light will compensate for those deficiencies without generating toxicity. So using both will be a benefit and you're hoping between the two, you balance the system out as opposed to relying just on one. Right, that's great. Well, Kevin, it's um, we've got a quarter of an hour or 20 minutes over time, and um, I really, really enjoyed it, and I'm sure everyone else has. But thank you very much for another absolutely wonderful uh, talk. Absolutely brilliant. I, I, I just couldn't see how we were going to talk for two hours on calcium. but um, I can go on and on and on and on and on. Um, <laughs> next month, next my, my wife's agreeing with me now. Next yeah. month, chlamydia. Oh, nice! I do like a bit of chlamydia. So I, I really thought you would, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what we're doing next month. I have to look forward to that one. I do love a bit of chlamydia. Yes, right. Well, thank you very much. Well, has, has anybody else got any questions? I mean, you know, I, I don't want to stop anyone. Anyone got any questions? Unmute yourself. Have I missed anything, or have I missed anything? Or should we all go home? Well, we are home, aren't we? But you know what I mean? We're home already. Hello. Well, I've got to go out and do the birds, and then I've got, I've got to, because um, it's not going to rain here tomorrow, so I've got to go and water. Is that it, then? That's it. Thank you very much, everybody.